Your real name's Harry. Harry James Barber. And you changed your name because why? The FBI's looking for me to rob the bank in California. And? Hey everyone, you're watching In Studio, and I'm so delighted today because we have Rachel Taylor. Hi. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having us. Uh, now you're here to talk all things Finding Steve McQueen. Yes. For those who haven't seen the film yet, can you kind of give a quick pitch to what the film is about? Yeah, well, it's inspired by a true story, um, an incredible true story, actually. It's, it's a true story it's, that was never told. Yes, yeah. it's the kind of story that you hear and you go, I can't believe I've never heard of this. But it's about uh, seven men from um, Youngstown, Ohio, that um, set out to commit what becomes one of the biggest bank heists in U.S. history, which is incredible. Is large, yeah, the largest bank. Yeah, heist. and they attempt to steal um, Nixon's secret millions, which is like um, a bunch of uh, money that he's hidden in California of secret and Dirty Ill illegal yeah. campaign donations. So um, yeah, it's a good 1970s story. Um, it's a, it's pretty incredible. That was a good pitch. We're done. Okay, that great. That was it. Done. <laughs> Um, for you, what drew you to Molly and drew you to the script? Well, I had, I'm always looking to try and um, balance projects between what I did last and the project that I'd come off at the time we shot this movie was Jessica Jones. Yeah. And, um, you know, Jessica Jones has like a psychological kind of noir palette. Um, and Finding Steve McQueen, although it's a bank heist movie on the kind of the surface layer, it also is kind of has a big heart and yep. a kind of comedic tone running through it as well. And um, comedy is not something that I'd done in a really long time. And I just like that Molly is the character in the film that is holding Harry Barber, um, who is played by Travis Fimmel, um, holding him accountable, accountable and demanding the truth out of him, which I think is kind of a really lovely, strong quality for yeah. a woman to, to play. Well, it is this, it explores this love story between them. Mm. Can you kind of talk about their dynamic and... Well, yeah, I think she's kind of, um, she's the, the, the tough one of the two, and she really does, like like I said, hold him accountable to the truth. And um, at the same time, they're both um, kind of bonded by their love of cinema. I think um, Harry has this kind of fantasy of being as cool as Steve McQueen, and of course nobody, if Travis does a good job, but no one can be um, as cool as Steve McQueen. Yeah. Um, I try sometimes. Well, just that whole like 1970s yeah. palette is so cool. I don't know why they were so much cooler than us, but they were. Um, uh, and, and Molly in her own right, I think, um, is a little bit of a mirror to Harry in a way. I think she also um, likes to fluctuate identities a little bit. And I think secretly she probably would like to be a celebrity. <laughs> um, so they're bonded over this um, kind of mutual love of escapism and cinema and being able to shift identities and wishing that they were um, better than, than what they are, I guess. So she has these ever-changing wigs. Did you have a ever favorite wig? Did you, did you keep one? Or? No, I didn't. No, that's weird to keep <laughs> the wig. You don't keep that bit. Um, but uh, I liked kind of the Jane Fonda okay. shag. Hair, you would never get a shag haircut now. It would be kind of too much to manage, but to, it was perfect to flirt with it for a minute was really fun. Now, Harry really idolizes Steve McQueen. Yeah. I was wondering for you, who are your idols? And as the character or I, as for Rachel you, for growing yourself, up? Yeah, oh, growing that's up. So, um, such a tricky one. I mean, I've been talking about this film for the past couple of days, and, and one of the things we've kind of landed on is it's the kind of movie movie that made us want to do what we do, which yeah. is be part of this business. You know, I grew up on a, a diet of films that were, you know, anything from like um, Breakfast Club to um, like Terminator, you know, like these big kind of, old, these big old studio movies um, that, you know, that mid-budget film that's not made so much anymore. So... I don't know, maybe Sarah Connor, I suppose. Okay. In that in that movie, um, in the Terminator movies or something. All that's, those. That's a really. Yeah, yeah, all those kind of like feminine heroes, like Sigourney Weaver and Aliens, that kind of came up at the time where I was probably you know, eleven or twelve and started watching those movies and became obsessed a, with them. Now there's also Trish and Jessica Jones, there's which Trish we'll get to later. Jones, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, this was the largest bank heist in the in the history. In history. In U.S. history. In U.S. I know. history. And it is. It's one of those stories that you But a lot go, of people aren't too familiar with it. So no. why do you think that was? I don't know. But I, I remember reading the script and it says on the front page, based on a true story, and you just read it and you're like, what? Yeah. How did I not know about this? Um, you know, not to mention they're essentially setting out to rob the president, which is a wild and crazy true story that he had stashed these 
you know, illegal, um, there's illegal campaign money in a bank in, in California, um, and that these small town crooks were the people that set out to rob him. And, you know, that's something that I really like about the film. It kind of asks this question, well, why was Harry Barber, who um, is, aside from the bank robbery, by all accounts, like, a very good man, yeah. and in real life, um, you know, people in the town that he spent time, um, that he spent time in after, um, when he was on the run from the FBI, all wrote letters to say, you know, Harry was such a, um, an asset to our community and such a lovely man. Um, please sentence with that in mind. Um, and someone like Harry Barber, who... I think he was sentenced at seven years. Yeah, ha someone like Harry Barber, who was so loved by the people that he met, was held accountable, but Richard Nixon wasn't. Yeah. Which is kind of a really interesting idea, what, um, what makes a good guy and what makes a bad guy, and why do we hold some guys accountable and not others? I just think there's some... There's an interesting theme it's in there. It's very true to today as well. Yes. Not to get into that. No, no we're not going to do that. We're we can, not, but no, but not, but totally. I mean, no. it really makes you think. Like, why do those big fat cats get away with it, yeah. and other the smaller guys don't? So there's a little like Robin Hood element. Yeah, exactly. Kind of through it, I think. No, and that's like the, yeah. the most powerful thing about the film. Um, in telling true stories, do you face different pressures as an actor? <laughs> what, what are they? Well, my character Molly He's, was um, more of um, she wasn't based on she was a, an she addition. was a, she was an yeah. addition, but but I think kind of secretly an amalgam of um, Harry, who Harry had dated, dated at the, at yeah. the time, but just that's just kind of subtly woven in there. So um, I didn't have too much pressure yeah. because she was more of an yeah, um, what... invention of fiction, but uh, I just met Harry Barber okay, recently, I was that. Um, who Travis uh, Fimmel plays in the film. Um, did Travis have conversations with him before? I'm not or? sure, but yeah, I, 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 whether this was that Travis is a wonderful actor and he is, but or whether it was just um, good casting on on um, Mark Stephen Johnson's count, I'm not sure. But they kind of had a similar body energy in in a way that was quite. Um, That's really interesting. Yeah, quite astonishing actually. They have like a similar kind of vibe to them. Which was cool. Going back to what you said about kind of Molly wanting to be this celebrity and kind of like ever changing mm. her identity. At the end, the Bonnie and Clyde moment yeah. very, very much stuck with me because it was at, almost as if they were happy with that. They were happy with being this Bonnie and Clyde story. Do you agree? Yeah, or? I remember feeling that, and that was actually the the last part of the film was the very first bit that we shot, yeah. um, which was tricky. But um, well, how so? Well, I was cast uh, in this film really late to it. Yeah. I think I was cast about f four or five days before we started shooting. So there was a little bit of a sense of like, whoa, I've just stepped into the 1970s, where am I? So but it also um, can be an advantage because A, I was coming into a film where the tone had already been established and Mark and Travis and the boys had already like set the rhythm and set the tone, which was... Um, such a loving and fun environment yeah. to be to to be part of. They were really um, very like warm and generous and um, loose in a way that that Mark really um, encourages improvisation and encourages um, exploration as an actor. But at the same time, he, when he hits on something that he knows is working, he'll kind of push you down that road if that makes sense. So. Um, that's so great. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> but but back to your question, the, the bit at the end where they do have this sense of the fact that they've emulated these movie yeah. stars that they look up to in real life almost is a little sweetener to the fact that they're is never going to see each other okay. again. Um, but I had felt the same thing when I was filming it, that there was something tragic but, but also cool the, yeah, about cool, it. Yeah, cool, but they're okay with it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. am I. Uh, what were some of your favourite memories from filming? Some of your other favourite memories? You know, I really enjoyed um, working with Travis, and uh, he's really... Did he kind of feel pressure about playing Harry? Or... I don't know. Okay. I don't know that Travis feels pressure At about any, <laughs> anything. But, but I think, um, you know, I knew Travis as a dramatic actor um, and obviously know how great he is in Vikings and have seen a bunch of his work. But I wasn't <laughs> prepared for how funny he, yeah. he is. He's really, really funny. He's quite a gifted comedic actor. Um, so that was a cool little surprise. No, I have to ask you, have you ever in your life considered robbing a bank? I love that the chair just <laughs> creaked when I did that. Um, I don't think so. Yeah. 
I mean, maybe, well, since, I fin- maybe <laughs> since I finished shooting the movie, yeah. I was like, oh. I mean, and also, amazingly, in, in Finding Steve McQueen, they were in that bank for three days. Yeah. They went back Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, or Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Th- no, Friday, yeah, Saturday, yeah. Sunday, to keep looking for this money, yeah. um, which is kind of not what you would expect from a bank heist. No. You would think Very, you'd get in and get out, but they but didn't. Yeah. They kept dipping back in. You didn't have any scenes with Forrest Whitaker. What kind of, how was... Just Whitaker that last scene at oh, the yeah, end yeah, 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 when, um, when Harry's arrested. arrested, arrested. Yeah. How was working with Forrest? I mean, um, amazing. Yeah. It was kind of a trip. He's, I look up to him so much. Um, and then suddenly he, you know, He's swaggers there. into the scene and you're like, wow, oh, damn, that's Forrest Whitaker. <laughs> he brings something so great to that role, I yeah. think, which is um, both... Um, himself and Lily Rav that play this um, play the the FBI agents that are looking for Harry yeah. Barber. Our characters never really cross paths, but um, I love the chemistry between Lily and Forrest. I think they're so great in the movie. One of the real standout scenes was when they were kind of tracking Forrest's character down, and mm. they thought he had a gun in the car, but then he was picking up his son from yeah, Lee. yeah. And you see Harry kind of have this like emotion of like, I don't want this to happen. Like yeah. there's kids involved and. Yeah, definitely the character of Harry Barber has this sense of um, morality, Hum- yeah. you know, and humanity. humanity. Yeah, he's not someone, he's not like a shoot him up kind of bank heist guy. Yeah. It's definitely, uh, he's troubled Which by makes his it actions. Which funny and complicated. Yeah. yeah, and I think it also makes him a very redeeming protagonist. Like, he is a cr- he's a criminal, but at the same time, just like in real life, everyone kind of attested to what a good man he was. Uh, before you go, I have to ask you about Jessica Jones. Please, please do. So I was, as everyone was, saddened by the news that season three will be its last. What was your reaction, I guess, the cast reaction to finding out? Well, you know, I'm so proud to have been part of the show and to have told that story. Like, we've had the most incredible um, fan experiences yeah. on that show, that I have had women come up to me in cafes and, and, and say, like, those characters mean so much to us. And, and usually they say... I wasn't a comic book fan, but those women are so complicated and they really speak to me and really move me. Thank you. We've, uh, it's been incredible being part of that journey. Um, and it's also been incredible playing Trish Walker, who is such a complicated, ambitious woman. You know, she re- she's, she's badass and she's also, I think, deeply jealous and she's a really compli- complicated, complicated yeah. woman. Um, so, you know, the truth is I could have kept doing that show for you know, five, six, seven years. Um, So I was, you know, it was really sad to see that it was cancelled. But at the same time, I am really excited to share um, season three with everyone. And I think we definitely go out with a bang. And also we have the luxury of, um, I think we could kind of foresee that there was a cancellation um, within sight. So I think we bring... um, a sense of completion to all of the characters that I think, um, I hope our fans will be satisfied by. What can you tease about what what that means? I mean, I guess I could tell it. I guess at this point might, I could yeah, say whatever well. I want. But, but Sorry, no, Netflix. No, but I don't want to, sp- <laughs> no, I don't no, want to no, spoil no. it. But um, yeah, it's definitely a cracker, a cracker finish. You mentioned that you could have played Trish for seven years. Well, I think that she was that interesting. Yeah. And that's not just because obviously I love working with you know, Netflix and Marvel and Kristen and Ika and Karen. Like, I lo- I loved the people that I worked with for the last four years. And I say four years because we did Defenders as yeah. well. So it did feel like four seasons. Um, but the reason why I could have kept doing it is because I still think that there was um, stuff to find in the characters. You know, that's how good the writing was. It's not... It didn't fall into a sense of... Um, uh, familiarity in a good way it kept me on my toes so I mean that's what you really want speaking of Trish and kind of the other characters you've played as an actor is there a character you wish you had more time with oh that's a great question you know I just shot a movie um an Australian movie actually called Ladies in Black with Bruce Beresford who did Driving Miss Daisy who's a very um important Australian director I think and I had a a sense of work work walking off that film um god I wish this one was a tv show I really wanted it to keep going um and you know to be fair finding Steve McQueen too they had such a um or we had such a good vibe on set and it was really fun dipping into that slightly lighter more comedic tone for me um I think this would make a great tv show actually I was thinking it would have made a great tv show 
It wouldn't, if it wasn't so based on a true story, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be... Yeah. I ending. mean, you could for sure play this out over a number of seasons. Yeah. One of the things I like about the film is that it's quite jam-packed with narrative. You know, Mark was saying when he was editing the film, he had to be very, very careful with what he took out because the, um, the true story is so intricate and the, the plot of this film is really kind of like Jenga. And if you took one scene out the whole narrative would, would crumble because it is, um, you know, crosses three different timelines and a bank heist and a romance. It's um, an engaging kind of story. That's a great way Complicated to, story. to say it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. You can check out Finding Steve McQueen in theaters now and on digital and on demand. <laughs>